this is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I talk with business coach, podcast host, and speaker, Jeffrey Shaw. We talk about creative business owners, his process of moving from New York to Miami, coaching for entrepreneurs, the role of millennials in the workplace, his one thing fallacy that he speaks about, and showing up as a witness. We also talk a little bit about Jeffrey's brand new book that's coming out and his process in writing that book. Enjoy the episode. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have Jeffrey Shaw on the show. And Jeffrey is a business coach, podcast host, and speaker on the subject of all things creativity. He is a believer that transformation requires both inspiration and implementation. Initially, he started his creative journey as a photographer before discovering a passion for helping others through coaching. And as the host of the Creative Warriors podcast, he speaks with other creativity experts, including Julia Cameron, Michael Gelb, Todd Henry, and Jeff Goins. His online coaching program, The Creative Warrior Unleashed, helps creatives make a living doing what they love by better marketing themselves and their talents. So welcome to the show, Jeffrey. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here with you. Thank you. So share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Oh, gosh. Well... Uh, on, our, on a personal level, I was sharing with you that we've uh, decided to leave the New York winters behind and are relocating to Miami. Um, and I guess, you know, although it's a personal endeavor, it actually has a lot to do with my career. Once I, in the past several years, as I've developed my coaching practice and got much more heavily into personal development, I found that I just, I, I needed sunshine more often, right? It's just, um, I, I knew my level of responsibility to my clients and to the, to the people I was serving that I need to show up fully. And that certainly that seemed to me to require a certain amount of, uh, of atmosphere and bright sunshine and walks on the beach, um, all of which to hopefully kind of refill the vessel <laughs> that I need to carry so that I can give it back out. And I think we actually had um, Hugh McLeod on the show recently as well, who's uh, like me, was a, actually a fellow Scot. He was brought, brought up in Scotland. And then uh, he now is in Miami. I think he, he was worked for many years in Chicago and um, had a great book on creativity, obviously ignore everybody as well. But uh, he said there's a great creative scene there. Obviously, it's been long known um, as a, from an artistic standpoint in terms of modern art a lot of, and great music as well. But I I hear a lot of people that are spending more time there or, you know, just kind of getting into this kind of Miami thing that seems to be happening. So you're, you're part of a, it seems to be part of a wider trend. Yeah, no, it's, and I agree. There's quite a scene here, but I have to say, as I said, what, what really inspired the move for me was the, the environment, mm. right? I mean, just really being in, cause I've, I relied on the energy of New York City, uh, having lived in Manhattan for many, many years. I really relied on that city to, which I'm eternally grateful for and from there. So, um, I, I needed the, the energy of the city to kind of get me going, get me to dream big. And, you know, now it's sort of tipped the other way. Now I've got a big life. I've got a very busy life. I do a lot of traveling. And what I need now to serve other people better is the opposite. Now I need the reservoir. Now I need the retreat mm -hmm. so that I can kind of come back into myself and re-prepare myself for the other uh, the fight of offering uh, what I have to offer to the world and as I mentioned at the top of the show originally a, a photographer but then you you found this 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 calling for coaching and how you could impact people through coaching so talk to us about I mean how did you kind of developed the the craft of, of coaching and that and that skill mm -hmm. so I took it upon myself rather boldly, I guess you could say, in about 1999, I think it was, to hire my first coach. And in 1999, at least here in the U.S., co business coaching was not something that that you really heard much about. Um, you know, if there was any talk of coaching at all, it was this weird life coaching thing, right? Where you know, I can remember my first my first exposure to life coaching was, well, why do you need a coach to learn how to live? Like, I, you know, <laughs> it, it just wasn't understood, uh, let alone business coaching. But nonetheless, I. Just had this, you know, as a lot of people do and people that come to me for coaching, just this this angst that I'm capable of more. Like you just is feeling like things are great, which is one of the uh, one of the most challenging places to be is when things are great, things are good. I know I should be really grateful, but I have this nagging feeling there's more, mm. right? Um, that's what I find people come to me 
feeling like when they reach out for coaching. And that's the way I felt in 1999. Um, and cause I was at, literally at the peak of my career and as a photographer and, but felt that there was, there was more, whether it was more happiness, more fulfillment, probably more business I was capable of more bigger dreams. So I found a coach who I was greatly aligned with, worked steadily with for seven years and it was upon his retirement, I decided that I would become a coach because I wanted to give back in the same way that I received from him. And um, so that was about seven years ago now that um, I went through coach training. And, you know, when one trains for, to become a coach, it's a, it's a life endeavor. I mean, you never stop training. Living, <laughs> living is training for coaching in a lot of ways, as well as the formal training that we receive. Uh, so yeah, it's been about seven years since I've you know, made the transition into coaching. I am still a photographer as well, just on a much more limited basis for the people that I, I um, my most loyal clients, but, um, you know, kind of have a mixed model of both. And uh, the clients you have on the coaching side, um, how many of them are already doing the kind of creative professionals already? They have maybe have creative they have businesses which are around their creativity and their talents. And how many of them are, what percentage are, the, are kind of people who, they, they aspire, they may be doing something else, they're doing a, a, a nine to five job or something, you know, maybe very successful and in a, a completely different industry, but they have this yearning to do something more creative. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question because it's changing. I mean, more and more often we're finding, um, people that are transitioning. I mean, here in the, in the U S anyway, there was a study done recently, um, that says that by 2030, 60% of the American workforce will be freelancers and independents. And, you know, one could say creatives. Um, and I'm sure that's probably true in a lot of other countries. So there's a major transition going on, which I fully un understand and embrace. I think we're living at a time where people, um, you know, the, the term location independent is sort of the new black, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. everybody talks about wanting to be location independent, myself included. I mean, I'm really gearing my life towards that. But I think the difference is now people are coming into their careers right from the beginning feeling that way. So they're building businesses that uh, they can build a life that's more location independent. So we have a lot of people transitioning out. For me personally, I still coach primarily the entrepreneurs and usually people that are have been in business for a number of years, um, anywhere from kind of that critical four to five year period all the way up to 20 years. Uh, because the, the person who's been in business for 20 years, it is, it's, it's an entirely different world today than it was 20 years ago when they started. And they're trying to figure out the new way of being in business. And then those that have been in business for four or five years are just going through the normal cycle challenges. Um, I do work with some clients that are in transition, um, but I wouldn't say it's it's necessarily my my forte. Although as I said, I'm getting more requests for that because I think we're seeing a lot more people wanting to leave their day job and create their dream job. Uh, and what are the, the pain points for those, those people who, who are on creative entrepreneurs? So they maybe have a, a photography business or a design business or, or they, they have something which is maybe around their ta their creative talents and, 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 and how they monetize it as well. What, what are the biggest pain points that you tend to find uh, in those people that they, they say, OK, I, I've got to get a coach. I've got to, you know, um, think about this and work with someone in, in a kind of smarter way. Yeah, it, it's all pain points. <laughs> you know, when you've decided, it's there's so many layers to that. You know, I, I think the big the big one I could summarize it by saying that the world is freaking upside down <laughs> when you go into business for yourself as a creative. And I do want to touch on uh, for a moment because I think it will help your listeners to understand that you know when we speak of creatives, as you and I are bouncing back and forth, and you probably would attest to this as well for your show that the term creatives just keeps getting broader and broader. Mm -hmm. Like we're not talking about people that are in the traditional arts yes that or, it's or, creative thinkers exactly right? and, and, that's, and we're not talking about like the mad men the creative department so like yeah. creatives were a, a department in a building and everyone else did uncreative work and then the creatives did the creative work that doesn't that we're not in that world no anymore. i mean it's it you know the the pure act of being in business for yourself is an act of creativity you yeah. know even if what you're selling is is completely it's a widget in a way but if you're selling a widget and you're trying to build a business on selling that widget you are creative because mm -hmm. you have to be I mean, that's it's going to take a very innovative way of thinking to succeed. So the definition of creatives in business is much broader than it's ever been. And, and truthfully, I, I somewhat jokingly said that it's all pain points because what happens is the world as we've known it has been built on a very traditional business model because it's been a world based on selling things, very tangible things. And a lot of us, you know, myself included as a business coach, 
even artists. Uh, you know, many people are in a business today where actually what they're selling is intangible. Even if what you create, the widget or the piece of art, even if it's something you can hold in, in your hands at some point, which seems tangible, it's not what motivates people to hire you. It's usually the promise of transformation, the promise that that piece of art is going to, you know, temporarily deliver you to a different place. It's the promise that that widget is going to make somebody's life better or easier. Um, that online tool, whatever it is, really what we're selling nowadays more and more often is something very intangible in the way of a benefit that's transformative, makes somebody's life easier. That's what inspires people to buy. And because of that, being in business is entirely different than what we've known it to be. So you, I've had the most brilliant, one of which one of my clients was a NASA scientist. I mean, I've worked with some of the most brilliant people who left that position, that job, and became uh, an entrepreneur and, and couldn't believe how challenging it was. You know, like, say, I'm a bright person. Like, why is this so difficult? Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, the world is kind of upside down. So it's you hit a lot of pain points. And it seems to be, obviously, that the, that the, the term creative or creative creativity is obviously quite a nebulous term and gets used in in different ways the the the, the only um the, the the industry i see the people i seem to find have a have a problem with that word obviously a lot of people in the traditional creative industries uh wear it as a badge of honor um but within the the corporate world it's interesting because they they for many many years they've shied away from using the word creative creativity uh in terms of talking about the organization and they've opted to talk about more innovation as a process more as a process driven thing rather than a lot of the maybe ideation and 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 that part of of creativity as well can you see that changing within within obviously a lot of the people that you, we're working with day in day out are, are kind of entrepreneurs um so maybe many smaller businesses or they're doing um you know traditional kind of creative industries type roles but within let's say your your maybe more traditional large companies are they getting this creativity thing mm. because because all the studies are showing that this creativity thing uh is going to be incredibly important in terms of competitiveness for countries and 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 companies. Yeah, I, I do think that they are. I think companies. I think what companies are getting is that the old promises no longer work. Right, the promise of job security, nobody's buying it anymore. The promise of you know you come take a job with the X Y Z company and we're going to take care of you. It's just you know my father was an IBM. My father was one of the first ninety employees of uh, IBM when they set up their first production plant, like really early on. And I, you know, it's the, the whole promise that big companies made in those days just doesn't hold true nowadays. So I think companies are starting to let go of that. You know, they can't make that promise anymore. They also realize that their employees are marketing themselves all the time, right? Whether it's on LinkedIn or working with headhunters, you know, companies are finally starting to get that they have not shown up in the world for decades now as really being good examples of loyalty to their employees. And employees in turn aren't expressing the same level of loyalty to the companies they work for. So the goods, the upside of that is I think it opens the door and companies now are starting to encourage creativity within the company the with they while recognizing the downside of that which is why they've held back from doing it for so long is that it could mean people are going to leave it more it it's very it makes it more likely they're going to move on because people if you encourage creativity within a company it's likely to make them want to express that creativity either by being an entrepreneur or maybe going to another company and that's i think that's why there's been some suppression in the corporate atmosphere is trying to kind of Keep suppress the creativity yeah. to keep to keep the company safe, and I think they're finally letting go of that because it's a losing battle. I mean, creativity is rising, and, and people are going to bust out and, and do their own thing anyway. And I suppose then it's dependent on the organization actually wanting to foster entrepreneurship as right. well, and and creating with its business units. and And I certainly find this from you know a lot of millennials who they've seen their 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 parents. Um, strive for a certain kind of thing in in the in the job in the world of work, and that's not what they 
that's not what gets them going. They they, no, they just they co- they completely feel completely disconnected from that. I think a lot of organisations are really struggling to try and and just putting in the, a football table or something is yeah. is like paint is painting over the cracks. Really, it's a much deeper thing than understanding what work means now for for people. And I had I know you you've had Chris Gillibo on the show. I just had him on, and we were just talking about this about almost thinking about the difference between when we used to think about our, our professions as being the thing to think about the importance of our working conditions, the, the, the environment in which we work and that inspires. And you said, right, you know, show one of the reasons that you're in Miami because it's an environment that inspires you and, and uh, you know, you, you, you love the light and you love the energy from that place. Yeah, it's absolutely. And it's, you know, you bring up a great point as far as the the evolution. Like I want to talk about the millennials for a moment, uh, not only because I have three of them who they are not <laughs> home anymore, but uh, I've raised three millennials. But, you know, I, I think you bring up a great point that it's there's been a, pro, a generational progression here. You know, two generations ago, my parents' generation, uh, they just they made huge trade offs. Right? They, they chose job security over personal fulfillment. They even traded off their personal happiness, happiness and stayed in relationships that maybe weren't fulfilling. But it's what you did, right? Two generations later, we now have this millennial generation, which is often being accused of being entitled, which I think is a very unfair judgment of who they are. I actually think at the heart of their ambition is a, just a complete unwillingness to trade off, right? They're saying, hey, this life is once and I'm going to live it to its fullest and I'm going to choose a job that's going to fulfill me. And if it doesn't exist, I'll create it. And I want to see the whole world. Guys like Chris Gillibo, like, hey, I'm going to visit every country. We're seeing so much more of that. And I think that's why, uh, you know, we were talking a moment about location independence. That's, I think, that it's just rooted in this idea that I don't want to be tied down to one thing because I want to live life to its fullest. And I, I do think it's actually been a, a progression and a change of values over the last two to three generations. And can you talk about in this creative journey that you've had as a, as a coach? Obviously, you, you, you're, you've had great success in doing that, and, and and working with other people to help them really live a live a more creative life. But can you talk about any insights or light bulb moments in your own life, in your own creative journey, where you've said, oh, "Okay, this is the direction I need to be going. This is the decision I need to be be making." Some something that was a bit, you know, it was a was that real kind of light bulb moment for you personally? Sure. Yeah, I have to say it was, um, I've, I've helped a lot of people through this stage, but it's definitely life changing for me. When I, having had a very successful photography business, um, and then when I started coach training, there was a, there was a level of guilt. You know, I felt like I was, you know, having an affair on my photography clients. If they, if my photography client, because why? Because we were, you know, like a lot of us, I was just, I was raised in a world that told me to focus on one thing. I was told that I could only be successful in business if I did one thing. And that worked really well for me in the 80s when I started my business. It was it was the, probably the right way to be in business then in the 80s. But we're not in the 80s anymore. This is th- more than 30 years later. Mm. So we're nearly 40 years after that. But in the 80s, that kind of niche niche, you know, message meant something. So, uh, you know, a couple of decades later, when I started my coaching practice, there was, there was guilt. I tried keeping it separate. I was building a coaching practice. I'm not letting my photography clients know because I felt like, you know, it would almost feel like I was moonlighting on them. And, uh, I was coach. I started coaching other photographers. So it was helpful to them to know that I was still a working photographer. So I had this real conflict on my hands that was causing me a really an undue amount of angst. And the big light bulb moment for me was I granted myself permission to not listen to that advice anymore, to not listen to the advice that I could only do one thing and that I was only capable of doing one thing. And that if I did more than one thing, I would be doing two things half-assed, which I ultimately realized was just a huge insult because just because we as creatives are interested and passionate about creating more than one thing or doing more than one thing does not mean we're a jack of all trades, master of none. As creatives, we are fundamentally capable of being really good at more than one thing. Mm. I'm not half the photographer I used to be because I'm also a coach. I don't, I'm not a less coach because I'm also a podcast host. As a creative thinker and a creative individual in the way that I structure my life, I'm able to be good at many things. And that 
was the light bulb moment for me when I granted myself that permission to build a business model that was far more diversified than was ever given to me as advice. And were there any kind of surprising ways that those those different that kind of portfolio like that portfolio career that different areas influence another area that you maybe didn't expect so something seeped in from your photography that really helped you on the coaching or from coaching into photography or, or some some other area i'm so glad you asked that because you know it's it you realize it's all connected right and that's the the um the more you step into kind of what's the core purpose here what's at the center right when you when you get closer to that you realize it's all connected and i realized that you know a couple a couple awarenesses one was that we're not necessarily given just one purpose in life or, you know, or maybe we are. I mean, I don't want to make a, a definitive statement here. Maybe we do have one purpose and maybe it, uh, you know, shows up of different ways. But what I know for certain is that while I spent 30 plus years as a photographer, in, in that act as a photographer, I felt I was doing my purpose. I felt that I was probably put on earth to be a photographer to the clientele that I served. If that's the case, then who am I as a coach? Because as a coach, I actually feel like that's that may even be my more purposeful work because that's the way it's showing up now. Mm. So that's why I say I'm challenged by the idea that we have one purpose. I actually think there's a there can be a deeper core purpose that all these things are connected to. And if I had to define it for myself, it has something to do with being a witness. The common denominator that I keep seeing show up in my life where I feel I have power is when I show up in some way, shape, or form as a witness. You know, as, a, as a photographer, I show up, I do family portraits, and I, I show up on, on location, I compose a family, I, I lay a lens in their direction, and there's an act of witnessing there that creates a transformation, that I see families reunite, I see individuals gain confidence uh, in comfortability that they didn't have before by this simple act of showing up and, and witnessing. And I find the same is true as a coach, you know, in, in, in the coaching relationship, it's, it's the presence and that, and the witnessing that actually creates the transformation. Same is true as a public speaker. When I'm on stage, I look out at the audience, you can see transformation happening by your simply being there. And there's a, there's a weight of responsibility that comes up, comes with that, that I take very serious so that I show up taking full responsibility for my impact that I have by being present. So there is a common denominator, and yet I don't like to be limited, as I've been told in the past, to only do one thing. I want to be a podcast host and a speaker and a coach and a photographer. And at its core, these things are connected for me. And, and I think that's what you just said there. I think that will resonate with a lot of listeners uh, as creatives of this thing constantly being told, well, you have to focus on one thing. You have to focus on one thing when their, their their brains just don't work like that and then from maybe from the outside that the claim is leveled against them well as you as you mentioned you're you're a jack of all trades a master of none and there's there's no real theme to what's kind of going on on here as well but i, I find it fascinating if you look at people like um richard Feynman, the, sci the scientist or oliver sacks or um i had a guest on karen elizari who's one of the foremost thinkers in um in cyber security and what you tend to find with a lot of these people that make these real big impacts is they're actually doing a number of different, they've been doing a number of different things. And it's how it's, it's, they see patterns that other people don't necessarily see because they have other influences. Not to, not to denigrate the idea of just like staying in one area and being totally focused on the niche and really digging down. That definitely has, has its place as well. But this ability to be able to propagate ideas from one area to maybe a, it feels like a completely different area and create something new I, I think is something that a, a lot of creatives would take heart from as well and, that, and this is not just when I say creatives as you said thinking about artists I'm talking about scientists and I'm talking about engineers and I'm talking about other people as well here yeah no I, I agree and and to your point there isn't it's not necessarily we're not criticizing people that find a niche and do just one thing the difference is they haven't been criticized <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean nobody goes around yeah. saying oh you know bad advice to just focus on one thing yeah. like that's never been criticized mm -hmm. and yet those of us that are on the other end of the spectrum have been getting criticized for years and we've been it's been suppressed that's what I think needs you know unleashing if you will <laughs> uh, excuse the tie-in with my own coaching program but that's actually where the name came from that's what I felt like needed unleashing was the suppression that was holding a lot of creative people back and, and allowing them to 
to create across different mediums. And what has always intrigued me is uh, the Italian Renaissance of the 1400s and how, you know, in the day, it was a compliment to be called a Renaissance man or a Renaissance woman, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Michelangelo, Da Vinci, amazing people capable of creating across a lot of different mediums. They were, as well as being scientists and philosophers and artists. And, you know, how all these, you know, centuries later did this suddenly become an insult to actually, you know, it's turned into you're a jack of all. Could you imagine telling Michelangelo you're a jack of all trades, yeah. master of none? Or, 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 you know, all the gentleman that was one of the founders of, of America, Ben Franklin. You know, if, if yeah. someone would say to him, you know, this, I mean, I mean, really, do you have to write as well as inventing some heating device? <laughs> exactly. I mean, come on, can you not just focus on, the, on one, yeah. on one thing here? Exactly. That's a great, great comparison, by the way. <laughs> uh, what, what's the best advice then that uh, obviously you give now great coaching to uh, to people, but what's some of the best advice that you've received about uh, being a creative warrior, having living a creative life? Hmm. Boy, you know, it's uh, can I can I answer that by saying what I think the worst advice I ever got, Absolutely. which turned out to be the best advice? Absolutely, because <laughs> uh, it's very fresh and on my mind. I'm I'm working on my first book, so when you're when you're writing a book, you, everything is just so it's so in your head. <laughs> and uh, so the the best advice I ever received was actually the worst advice I ever received, which came from my mother, who I love dearly. Um, and I trust perhaps will not listen to this episode. So, <laughs> so she, this one will come back to haunt me. Please, but, mother, if you're listening to this, please turn off this, the episode now. I said I loved you. Um, the I was raised with this idea that you take the good with the bad and no one's perfect. And I think a lot of us were. Right. I mean, it just was ingrained. Oh, you take the good with the bad. And that set the stage for me and I believe for a whole generation of us to make trade offs and compromises in our life. And what I have learned from the millennial generation, what I think they innately evolved into was not taking the good with the bad and saying, I just want all good. I want a career that fulfills me. I want a relationship that makes me happy. I want to live not in one place. I want to live in multiple places. I want to take on the world. So, it's not an either it, or. Yeah. I mean, you know, it is a black and white world. You know, it, it is. And I think this idea, this this advice that I was always given was always, you know, take the good with the bad. And for most of my adult life, that set me in a course of, of life looking just that way. You know, business life was going great, but the personal life was sacrificing. And then the personal life was really going well, but the business was sacrificing. Or, you know, even within the content of the business, there was – you know, they say there's a, people have a fear of success. And with that, the close cousin to that is an avoidance of abundance. <laughs> and the I think the biggest reason that there's an avoidance of abundance is because of this trading off, that the, the lack of willingness to actually have it all. And uh, so that, that advice actually, for me currently, has turning out to be uh, that worst advice turned out to be the best advice because... I turned it around and decided to do something very different with it, um, which in turn has become in the context of the book that I'm writing so I can help others do the same. But I mean, that's very important. I know a musician who I was speaking to the other day, he was a very successful musician, and I, I was asking about his inspirations. And he said, well, he remembers seeing uh, another musician and he watched this person do a, con a show. And he said, I, I, I was really got really curious and fascinated because everything that person did, I hated. I hated the way that the person, this kind of style that the person played, all the little things that the person did. And I made a promise to myself, I will never <laughs> play like that. Uh, yeah. uh, and it was just, it was almost like choosing a, a negative in photography, you know, just going for the absolute opposite. Because I, I know that's absolutely not where I want to go. Uh, so if I just, everything that, we're, what that is, if I just turn, think about what the, the opposite of that is, that's, that's where I want to go with my music and my career. Yeah, I I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of value in that. That, that was my that was my dating strategy. I would whatever whatever somebody said they wanted, and I was always the opposite. I would say, well, do you want to try the other side to see if you like that too? <laughs> and 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 you obviously you you help people in, in kind of different mo modalities. You do the the coaching, you know, the one-on-one -on -one style coaching. You have your your um your writing. You have the the podcast, the more an auditory side. You have the public speaking. You have the online uh, courses that you that you do as well. It, uh, which of these ones do, do you tend to find that you um you have the the, the the you get the most joy and the most pleasure from? 
Well, I have to admit, it's probably the podcast. Um, and I guess I struggle to admit that because it's it's the least profitable part of my business um, <laughs> and takes up the most amount of time. It's, yeah. it's, the, it's the thing that if I always thought if I, bought a, if I brought a business strategist into my business and said, you know, I need to solve some problems, whether it was profitability or time management, one would look at the podcast and think that's the first thing that has to go. <laughs> but it is so I mean, it's been life changing for me. It has created a platform for me that, you know, it's actually made it easier to get hired as a speaker. Uh, it's created a level of influence for me that I didn't have before. It's the best part and was never expected was the relationships, you know, as you experience as a podcast host as well. And I hope that you and I will stay connected. I mean, the relationships that it builds are just incredible and, and continue to those, you know, and I don't let those relationships die. I, I they're so valuable to me. I, I nurture them. Um, you know, and it's turned out to be the biggest life lesson for me. The reason I started my podcast two years ago was probably for reasons that no one should ever start a podcast. Um, and it was I became very curious as to what life would look like for me upside down, if you will, because prior to two years ago, as a photographer, as a coach, I mean, I've been I've been at the game of being an entrepreneur since the age of 14. I've never actually had a job, uh, a real, a quote unquote, a real job. I've always, from the age of 14 on, created something. And so I've been an entrepreneur since the age of 14, before I even could pronounce the word probably. And um, because of that, I've, I'm a chaser. I'm a really super hard worker. And two years ago, I had this awareness, and a, which became a personal challenge, wondering if, if I was worth people showing up for. If I created something in the way of a podcast, so it was a platform, and I became the host, not the guest, because as a, as a chaser of your success and as a, as a photographer and traveling the world for my clients, I was the professional guest. I was always doing the chasing. And I wondered what life would look like if, if, if I was the host. Would people show up? Mm. So it actually started for me as a personal challenge to start a podcast, say, I'm here. This is the theme of the show. Start inviting people um, and see if people would show up. And um, I, I'm pleased to say people showed up in droves, um, guests and listeners. And it's been a very successful podcast. But it, it like I said, unlike most people, it, was, it wasn't a strategy. It wasn't a business strategy. It was actually was a personal challenge for me initially. But I, I think there's something so great about this, the medium of, of podcasting, actually um, spoken word more generally as well. Um, because if you think about it, the 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 privilege that, that we have as hosts to we're in the, in the earbuds of someone like going right <laughs> directly into your mind as we're as we're speaking just now as well. And it, it, it always has felt to me like quite a personal type of way of, of communicating where, I mean, I love video and I do a lot of video and video is great as well. But there's just something, the gaps, the breaths, there's something about podcasting that uh, and, and, and audio that just feels just a, a, a little bit more considered at times, I would yeah. say. It's, it's intimate. Yeah. Right. I mean, I agree with you. It is a privilege on both sides. Like I, I, it is a deep privilege for me to connect the work of the amazing guests that I interview with the audience that I serve. Like that, that is a privilege beyond on most days, most of my comprehension, honestly. I mean, I, I look at the, that privilege and think I am blown away by the opportunity here. And, but, it, and it is intimate. You know, because people out there, they may be jogging, they may be driving in their car. Um, one of my really loyal listeners uh, who had a, a parent, an elderly parent who was, you know, ailing, you know, ailing and, and she had to travel quite some distance, told me that she would listen to the podcast back and forth to visit her mom. I mean, that's, a, that's an intimate life moment mm. that she's taking my podcast along on. So I think that's the thing with podcasting that, um, that you know, you certainly seem to understand as well. It's, it's a very intimate experience for our listeners. They're taking us on certain activities of their lives that is a deep honor to be a part of. And something you're obviously great at doing is helping um, 
creatives with the how to better market themselves and 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 their talents as well. So, unfortunately, we don't have time here, and I'm going to direct everyone to your to your site um, so they can they can check out all the all the programs and everything you have. But are there are there any kind of online resources or tools that that you love that that you, you when you deal with a lot of clients you kind of help you suggest them in terms of how they they market themselves. Hmm. Gosh, well, marketing is, as you said, it's a, it's a big topic, and it's it's marketing and branding is one of my favorite things to talk about because uh, you know marketing and branding is not about being clever. <laughs> Maybe it was 20, 30 years ago, but what the reason I love to talk about marketing and branding is that it requires a lot of soul searching and clear definition of the people you're going to serve, and then what's the energetic through line that may bring those things together. Mm. Um, so that's why I love to talk about marketing and branding because it's really about relationship building. As far as uh, practical tools to to use that way, uh, other than the obvious, I'm a huge Evernote user and uh, some of the more obvious ones. I would say something I use on a daily basis that may be a little more out of the ordinary is an app uh, for my phone called Word Swag. Yeah, it's a great um, app. It's a, cr- a tremendous app. And here's the crazy thing. I've, I do a lot of public speaking, as I mentioned, and I happen to have uh, a number of them lined up right now. And the, the last three public speaking events that I've spoken at, you know, keynotes, I haven't created the entire presentation on WordSwag, which is crazy to me because I'm, I'm a photographer. So I, I'm used to Photoshop. Like I would spend endless hours in Photoshop, but I can actually create better visuals in WordSwag and pull off, you know, keynote presentations using using WordSwag. And then um, I guess as an extension of that technology, we also have uh, the, the technology to, which I offer to all my audiences, we take the visual presentation, which again, being a photographer, I have to say my, my presentations are quite attractive. They're visually, they're visually beautiful. And I convert it into a mobile app and I provide that for my audience at the end. I give them a, a simple link so that they can download it to their mobile device. And I do that because I want them to be at ease during my keynote or during my workshop so that they're not taking a lot of notes, just taking the necessary notes. But anything they see in a slide is going to be available to them in a mobile app. And it puts audiences at ease and makes the material more retainable. And then we provide that app for their phone. So that's another extension of that technology is to allow them to to download to their mobile device to create an app. That's a great idea. And and obviously you're you're doing a lot of public speaking and you're working you're working on a book as well. And and the, the, you know the, the common idea goes well in order to get public speaking uh, you know gigs you have to have a, have a book. But you've managed to build a public speaking career not having the book as as the business card but actually having your your podcast and the platform you're built with podcasts as your way into a lot of these these speaking gigs to some degree i mean i started speaking primarily in the photo industry and that was a more obvious transition right because it was within my industry so that the most of my public speaking events first came within the photo industry but then you know the interesting thing was that i had uh you know wait staff and uh and event planners in the back of the room who would come up to me afterwards and say you do know everything you're talking about has nothing to do with photography <laughs> <laughs> and i'd say i know that i'm just looking for the you know i just working towards the audience that also knows that so, so i was a little in a way pigeonholed in the beginning because of the field of which I came from and was able to bust out of that because the concepts of, you know, you know, my primary concept is when you're in business marketing yourself and your talent, it requires a different business model. So that's what I was helping photographers understand. But that that those concepts are universal. So that eventually got me out of the photo industry and speaking to other organizations. So you're right in that my unlike a lot of people, I had the kind of the platform for speaking before I had the book. Um, and honestly, I'm glad I waited. I actually attempted writing a book a couple of years ago, and uh, it ultimately became my online coaching program, The Creative Warrior Unleashed. The book started feeling more like a how-to manual, so I, I gave up on the book and made it an online program that I felt would be more useful. Thinking the book, I always thought the book that I, with the first book I would write would be a pretty practical business book because that's uh, what my my head works very well in that that field. Um, but as it turned out, it was actually this turning point moment in my life of what was my own glass ceilings, if you will, what was keeping me from really having the full and complete and abundant life, not just categories of my life working well, but the whole thing working well was really getting into this idea of a willingness to have it all and to get rid of the avoidance, abund- the abundance avoidance, like to get rid of the abundance avoidance and, and embrace having it all. That became the topic of the book. And 
while I love to help people, and what I think I'm very good at is helping people build successful businesses, I think I have to put this book out first to open up their mindset to having it all yeah. before I can teach them to build the business that gives them it all. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one as well. And I, I've spoken to a, a number of people now who um, they, they kind of feel that they, they should do the book and they're told to you know, you've got to do you've got to do a book. But for them, it's just not the medium that they particularly enjoy. You know, they, they, they love speaking or they love um, you know, public speaking or they love video or they love there's other things that they it is their preferred. And, and the writing one is, is, is a little bit of a uh, traumatic uh, experience um, for them to, to get through. But uh, as you say, sometimes when, when the time is right, the, the time is right. And and uh, it's, it's something that you've, you've got time to do. And it sounds like now it comes at a perfect time for you as well, because you with all these guests that you've had as well, in addition to your own experiences, you're able to uh, consolidate some of that information and, you know, and provide that to, to readers in, in, in that form. Yeah, I think, you know, you can, I think a key thing of what you just said there is that you can, we can wait for the inspiration of ideas sometimes. I mean, we also, I believe, and again, that's why I'm moving to Miami. Like I, I'm, I am a strong believer in uh, creating the environment for creativity to come, mm. right? Because we can't just, you can't just sit back and la la land and wait for things. Then, then the results of your life are likely not to be what you want them to be. So you have to initiate. So I'm a big fan of creating the environment that will create creativity. And then once that inspiration comes along, you then have to have discipline in order to, to follow through and writing, you know, so I'm gl- grateful that the inspiration for this book idea kind of came up on its own as a result of my own personal life changes. But the act of writing the book is a discipline, right? Yeah. I mean, my, my calendar is crossed off every afternoon for four hours, and that's the time I write. So ultimately, it also takes the discipline to uh, just create the follow through on the uh, in ideas of inspiration that we have. And while we're talking about books, if you could recommend just one book and one record to our listeners, mm-hmm. what would they be? Wow. For a guy who reads three to five books a week, that's really hard. <laughs> um, and I feel like I've said you know certain books over and over again. So I'm actually going to offer you, because of the top, so much of what we spoke about today, I'd love to put this book out there as an idea. Um, it's uh, The Geography of Genius. Uh, and it is, the, the author is Peter Sims. Gosh, I hope I have that right. Again, I read so many books. Um, it, the idea is he studied pockets of genius throughout the world and what effect the environment had on that genius. And I became, I just so loved this book because it brings up that big question, which came first, kind of like the chicken or egg. Yeah. Was it the environment that created the genius? Did the genius create the environment? Um, he had kind of delivers his own conclusion for which people are going to have to read the book to kind of get his his take on which came first. But I love that because it really enforces what we were just saying, how we can also we can also, I want to say, almost take control of our creativity. Uh, and in a way, you can if you create the environment for the creativity to come forward. So that definitely would be a favorite um, a favorite book. As far as a record, I'm going to maybe offer a, a single, not a, not a whole uh, collection or an album or CD, but uh, one single al- uh, song that inspires me greatly is by the band One Republic. And the song is I Lived. And um, I, I don't think it's that's like my driving song. Like I blare that song at volumes unhealthy to one's ears <laughs> because it just and it's it's currently my funeral song. I don't plan on going anywhere for a very long time, but everybody in my life knows that should something happen, that's the song I want played at my funeral. <laughs> well, I'm sure all listeners are curious now to see what does this this song sound like. Um, so if people go to jamestaylor.me and just go to the show notes, just put Jeffrey Shaw in in the search bar, you'll be able to get all these show notes of all these different things we're, we're, we're speaking about and, and these links as well. So just as we start to finish up here, Jeffrey, let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and you had to start from scratch. So you have the tools of your trade and the knowledge that you've acquired over these years, but you have no, no one knows who you are. You have no platform, no fan base. You've got to start from scratch. How would you restart? Hmm. You know, I would actually welcome that opportunity. I think it's a beautiful thing. Uh, I've always been a, I've always been for myself more comfortable being a little fish in a big pond. So when I can, when I can start feeling the edges, I move on. I, I go to a bigger place. Um, because I actually really enjoy that. Like, how can I be a stranger in this land so that I can uh, challenge myself? The first thing I would do is build relationships. You know, I think that's the 
the most incredible thing about being in business and in the world today is the way that we can build relationships. Social media, you know, I mean, email. I, I It's been a very interesting observation even with email for a guy like me who's been in business more than 30 years. I was doing business before email was invented. And of course, when email came along, there was this criticism that was going to make business less personal. I actually think it makes business more personal. People exchange words and feelings and thoughts via email that they might not in person. And I feel that way about social media today with all its criticism of how much time it takes. I've formed very deep relationships for with people around the world because of Periscope and because of Facebook. I've been invited to speaking engagements or, you know, because of uh, social media. So that's the first thing I would do. And that's the beautiful thing about being in business today is that, you know, a lot of the ways that we build relationships are don't cost any money, right? You just, you create the platform, build the relationships. And uh, I think at any point, any place in the world, you can start again. Absolutely. Great advice. Well, Jeffrey, thank you so much for coming on the show. What is the best ways that listeners can connect with you and learn uh, what you're up to? I think the best way to, to get a flavor for my mindset and, and create a connection and a relationship between us is uh, to give a try to uh, a program, a free online program I offer. It's called Week of the Warrior. And you just simply go to uh, weekofthewarrior.com. And uh, it's a seven day kind of uh, flavor of, of coaching and it asks you some powerful questions and each day when you answer the question you get a piece of a puzzle it's normally a $37 program but for your listeners it would be free if they just enter the promo code podcast so by simply entering the promo code podcast they would get it for free and uh, I think it gives you a really good roundabout flavor of the way that I work and also will uh, allow us to connect with one another well that's very kind of you did that for listeners I'll put all those on the show notes so people can go and sign up for that 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 uh, that program as well Jeffrey thank you so much I wish you all the best with your your move to Miami and for the new book and everything that you've got going on in your world and for the podcast it's a great show I highly encourage people to go and check out the show and subscribe on on iTunes and subscribe to the show as well I wish you all the best Jeffrey thank you so much for having me I appreciate it hey James Taylor here again And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.